As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had, done, he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. If it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mothers or father or children or fields to me and the gospel, for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecutions, and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Here ends the reading. Are you rich? Put your hand up if you are rich. (laughs) For those of you who don't have your hand up, have you ever had someone assume that you were rich and then told them that you weren't? I have. Three years ago, I was sitting at the kitchen counter, and son number three was there with me, And he asked me if dad and I had always been rich. I stopped in my tracks looking puzzled. Why would he think that? Apart from the fact that he had just attended a birthday party at downtown Woodstock in a semi-detached home. And then I realized our family is a split family And the older boys and the younger boys had very different upbringings. So the older boys remember our farm when we moved in. And came winter, we put our hands on the inside of the glass windows to leave handprints in the frost. And it had been about 15 years of blood, sweat, and tears later for this younger son to ask us if we were rich. So I quickly got out the photo albums of the farm we bought with our parents' backing to show him what it was like back then. Now maybe you are like me, and your first reaction to someone saying we are rich is to disprove it and compare ourselves to someone who we know really is rich. We can all think of someone we would consider rich, and we would consider ourselves not rich. And this matters deeply, because when we hear the passage, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. We think it doesn't apply to us, because we are not rich. However, what if with that same passage, I asked you to show your love for God with the same challenge Jesus posed when he looked at the rich man with love and said in Mark 10, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. How do we feel about this challenge? 
probably much like he did in Mark 10, 22. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. According to a very quick internet search, we are in the top 10 wealthiest people in the world. You are rich. Jesus here is talking about Canadians. He's talking about people who live in Plattsville and the GPA because we are rich. So today I want to talk to you about why is it so hard for rich people to give? What does the Bible say about giving? And then, of course, a personal challenge for us to give. So let's start off. Now that we have established that we are all rich, why is it hard for rich people to give? Well, the most important, scams. We have all known of someone who's been scammed, been scammed, or are very sensitive of scams. We don't want to get scammed. We don't want to waste our money giving it to someone who is scamming us. The second reason is lack of compassion. We might think, I worked hard, and they can work hard too, like I did. The next reason might be the complete opposite, compassion fatigue. Right? There are so many needs. There are hurricanes and tornadoes and wars and more wars and persecution and homelessness, and we know about them all, and it's too big. And how will my $20 make any difference? Another reason might be a lack of financial accountability. We may have heard of celebrity pastors who fly in private jets or leaders of not-profit organizations who are paid enormous amounts of money. So we don't want to give to that. And another reason is self-sufficiency. People who are rich have very little need for God. We are self-sufficient. We don't need him. We can buy everything we need. Healthcare is free. So unfortunately, rich people generally aren't known to be big givers. I remember before I was on staff here, and I did horse-drawn wagon rides and sleigh rides for the public. And in that industry, tipping is customary. However, I would know that if a BMW or a Mercedes or another car signifying financial status would come down the lane to arrive for a sleigh ride, there would be no tip today. The biggest tippers were the ones who I could see were not as well off. But somehow, they were more thankful. And in their thanks, giving. They gave. I talked to a waitress once that told us that nobody wanted to work Sunday lunch shift at Swiss Chalet because middle-class church folk are the worst tippers. Ouch. In comparison, last year when we went to Kenya to meet our Compassion-sponsored child, our friend had told us to make sure we invite them to our hotel so we could show Brian and his mom the ocean and give Brian the opportunity to swim in a pool and to be able to host them because Kenyans always want to host you. And this was very true. Brian's mom was self-conscious that we had come to her country and she didn't host us. She told us the next time we come, she would host us at her house. She wanted to host us in her one-room mud floor a single mom of two boys with no income. She didn't get to host us, so she brought us a gift instead. She had such thanksgiving. Sadly, often the more you have, the less generous you are, because the more you have, the more self-sufficient you are, and the more you rely on yourself to provide. Self-sufficiency is a thanksgiving killer. Therefore, the more rich, generally speaking, the less generous we are. The Kenyans are so poor and have such a culture of generosity that really should embarrass us. We are rich. Do we have a culture of generosity or do we have a culture of excuses? It's Thanksgiving. Do we give with thanks? So what does the Bible even say about giving? 
Well, there are over 2,000 verses concerning money in the Bible, and about 15% of Jesus' teaching references money. The Bible has a lot to say about money. In the Old Testament, the people of God gave a tithe of all they had to God. And so this money would go to the priests and the Levites, the people who served in the temple. It would go to upkeep the temple. It would go to provide sacrifices made to God on behalf of the people. And the tithe was distinctly the first 10% of all their money, animals, crops, income, and not the last. This made sure that it was the very best that was given to God and not the leftovers. The firstborn son, animal, the first 10% was holy and set apart for God. And this was a reminder that God was their source, right? That all provision comes from him. Now, I can hear you thinking, but Libby, we are not in the Old Testament, Jesus came and took away our need for sacrifices, the need for the temple, because God's Spirit came to live in the hearts of mankind and not in a building. And you are right, this is true, and we are not under Old Testament law. We are in Canada. And in first world countries, we have often forgotten that God is our source and that all that we have comes from him. So ask yourself today, who is your source? Is it your job, your RSPs, or is it your God? Have we forgotten this because we are so self-sufficient? We are so rich in materialism and yet often so poor in spirit, which is why Mark 10, 21, Jesus looked at the man and loved him and said, one thing you lack, sell everything and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. You are right. We don't have to give 10% like in the Old Testament. We get to give it all. Jesus asked him for everything financial, as well as his very life commitment. We are challenged to give it all. And what is our reaction? His reaction at this, the man's face fell. And he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone rich to enter the kingdom of God. Why did he go away sad? Because the rich man thought that when he gave it all to God, he would lose it all. So I'll add another reason that rich people are stingy towards God, and it's because they don't trust that God will return it back to them. They think that they can outgive God. They don't know their Bible, that everything you give to God is only what he has first given to you. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Luke 6.38, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 7. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should Give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Well, to me, that sounds like good financial advice. But do you believe it? Or are you the rich man feeling sad? 
When Jesus was talking to the rich man, Peter spoke up, as usual, Peter style, to say what the others were thinking. You see, the disciples were not all poor. They had a fishing business. There was a tax collector. Then Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. And Jesus replied, truly, I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Do you see that Jesus' promise for return on investment is in this present age and in the life to come? Do you see that there underlined? No one will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age and in the age to come. Those who are given finances and kept it for themselves and are not generous to give back to God will be judged on that. There are many parables Jesus told about stewardship and judgment or reward to follow. But if we don't give financially to God, we don't trust him as our source. Jesus said in Matthew 6, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How do we store up these treasures in heaven? Remember the story of the widow sharing her very last meal with God's prophet, Elijah. Remember the widow who put her very two last copper coins in the offering at the temple. Remember the disciples leaving their well-paying jobs to follow Jesus. So what treasures have we stored up in heaven with our financial thanksgiving? At church, we are coming to year-end budget planning for 2025. Now, historically, we have received a government grant to cover our full day camp costs. But this year... We did not cover building maintenance costs, cleaning costs, janitorial supplies. And so are we willing to add money to our budget to tell the children of this town about Jesus, to show them his love? Are we willing to give so that others would know the gospel? Our church is a light on a hill. We are a mission in this town, and the most unchurched people group is a generation. A generation who does not even know the name of Jesus, or that Jesus is God's son, or that there is no other name by which we must be saved. They don't know that we don't work for our salvation. They don't know that we don't have to be good to enter the kingdom of heaven. We simply have to rely on the grace of Jesus' sacrifice. They don't know about forgiveness of sins, and they don't know about the joy of eternal life. So are you willing to commit to this church family to keep this amazing building maintained so that we can run church on Sundays, junior youth group on Tuesdays, kids' time on Wednesdays, senior youth group on Thursdays, the Christian school from Monday to Friday, clothed in love giveaway on spring and fall and day camp for six weeks in summer. And also so that we can be the host for AA on Mondays and that we are the biggest facility in town so that when funerals need a big place to go, they come here. When the Lions Club needs a location, they come here. And many times I have sat in my office as people have walked into our building and been completely disarmed. And I've heard them outside my office say things like, wow, this is what the inside of a church looks like. This looks pretty normal. Are you willing to give your first and your best so that people are accepted, 
People are loved. People are presented with the good news of the gospel. What is this worth to us? And I don't mean ideologically. I mean financially. Jesus gave it all. And I mean all. What are we willing to give? Now maybe I have ruffled your feathers the wrong way, and you think there's no place for a pastor to talk about finances. Well, did you know today is also National Skeptics Day? And you might be skeptical about the Bible saying you'll receive a hundredfold in this life. I understand. Many prosperity gospel preachers have sadly duped people out of their money, saying, give me a dollar and God will give you a hundred. And then those prosperity preachers have gone on to buy a private plane. And then God didn't give the giver their hundred in return. And so then the prosperity preacher said they didn't give because they didn't have faith and they should try again. James 3, 1 says the teachers will be judged by God more severely than others. And I fear that pastor's retribution from God. But I will give you a comforting fact. Plattsville Church finances are not run by me or by Gavin. Plattsville Church is headed by a board who makes financial decisions. And any decision over $10,000 has to be brought to the congregation, to you, for a vote. We have our checks and balances in place. And speaking of budgets, a final reminder, ministry leaders, that budget requests need to be submitted by the 15th of this month. And all budgets then are brought to the board who bring the submissions to the congregational meeting, which will happen in November. So today, we are not talking about my salary. We are talking about giving to this church ministry because it is what God has asked us to do to show our belief that he is our source, so that he may pour blessing upon us. Malachi 3.10 brings the whole tithe into the storehouse, that they may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So in regards to our faith, we are told not to test God. Don't ever say, God, if you do this for me, then I'll do that for you. However, in regards to our finances, we are encouraged to flip it the other way. God, I will bring my 10% into the storehouse, and I will test you and see if I ever lack. If you are a farmer, you know that the storehouse you withdraw hay from in winter is the same storehouse you need to fill in summer. The verse tells us to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. So spiritually, if Plattsville Church is your storehouse, the place you make spiritual withdrawals by attending ministries or by using the building, then God instructs you to put deposits into this storehouse. He doesn't just encourage you to do this. He asks you to test him to see if he will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour so much blessing, there will not be enough room to store it. So we as a church are engaged with this on all levels. Plattsville Church Board was challenged in regard to our giving, our thanksgiving to our conference. Our church is a denomination of churches where we have workers over us who support us, they check in on us, they adjust policies to protect us. And we even have the president of this denomination as a member of our congregation. And the denomination asks us as a church to give 5% of our offering as our thanksgiving to them so that they are able to support us. But many churches had to cut back because times are tough, inflation has gone up, people stopped coming during COVID, people stopped giving. And this showed that our modern-day giving to the modern-day Levi's, the priests, the denomination, was the last line on our budget. And so God challenged me that it should be the first line. 
God challenged that if, as a church, we were lacking funds, it was because we, as a church, were robbing God of our tithes and offerings. So I took it to the board, and they were immediately able to change that giving to be the 5% that the denomination has asked for. So we, as a church, are back in alignment with God's word. Now we need to ensure that we personally are in alignment with God's word. If you are newer to our church, you might not know that Plattsville Church has a DNA of generosity. You are part of a very generous family. This gym was an addition built in the late 80s with zero debt. My family had not begun to attend here then, but during my time, the bathrooms on the main floor were also renovated with zero debt. And we live in an upside-down kingdom of God, and you and I know that nobody has zero debt these days, but we do. I know churches with million-dollar debts being paid on their building. And God has thrown open the storehouse upon us. The measure you give will be the measure you receive, pressed down, shaken together, running over. May we give generously to receive even more generously in this life and the life to come. So don't forget to pay into the storehouse from which you withdraw. Test God in this. Make a commitment for what God has put on your heart. Maybe write that commitment on your phone, what God is challenging you. The paper and put it in the offering box. 2 Corinthians 9, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and who sows generously will reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, not under any compulsion by me. God loves a cheerful giver. We have our offering box out at the back every week. We no longer pass the plate. And every week, checks and cash go in there. But as you can see from the slide behind me, electronic is an easy way to give. You can text, you can email transfer, you can set up automatic withdrawals so that when you forget, you still remember. Now, I know it's awkward when the pastor is talking about giving and the pastor is paid by giving. But I would absolutely love if everyone here volunteered me out of a job. How fantastic it would be if we all worked 80% and gave 20% in time and money so that staff were not even needed. Before I was a pastor here, I was a volunteer here. I ran the youth group. This church is my passion, you are my family, and this is only my job for as long as God calls it to be. So today, this Thanksgiving, I want us to go away with a deep knowledge that we cannot outgive God. And our Thanksgiving is done as directed by Jesus. Luke 6, give and it will be given to you, a good measure pressed down, shaken together, poured into your lap. For the measure you use will be measured to you. And many who are first will be last. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come and your will be done as it is in heaven. Father, give us this day our daily bread, our daily needs, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Forgive us, Lord, for our stinginess. Forgive us for our lack of generosity. Forgive us for thinking that we provide for ourselves. Forgive us for our lack of belief transferred into action in our thanksgiving. Lord, as we receive your forgiveness, may your grace empower us to forgive others who have sinned against us. May we come to the altar with a clean heart and a cheerful attitude to give financially to advance your kingdom in our mission field of Plattsville area. 
Lead us not into temptation of self-sufficiency. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now in this life and forever in the eternal life to come. Deliver us from the evil one, for you are the first and the last, the beginning and the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.